time they can visit and listen to these talks. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, so thank you, uh, uh, Jason. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for uh, agreeing to give talk for this uh, air quality management uh, lecture series. And uh, today, this month, this is the 42nd lecture. And uh, we started in 2020 in October. And I, I'm going to briefly mention some of the activities which we have carried out related to air quality management. Uh, I, I welcome all the uh, participants uh, for this uh, talk. Uh, go to the next. Uh, so this uh, basically the idea of this uh, uh, lecture series is to become give some platform to young researcher and scientists and also engineers, educators. Uh, to work in the area of uh, air quality management and uh, also provides an opportunity to collaborate with uh, various stakeholders. Next. So these are all uh, you know, eminent speakers who gave talk uh, in the earlier uh, air quality management uh, lecture series. Go to the next. So the last talk was given by uh, Professor uh, Dr. Chitra, Madras Medical College. She talked about uh, health risks and indoor air pollution. Next. We also started uh, an air quality management association. It is similar to AWMA, uh, where we focus only on air quality issues. And basically, we wanted to reach out to the students across the country and, uh, you know, bring awareness, provide some uh, information on the air quality management. And whenever we organize some training program workshop, we invite these students to join us and attend the programs in IIT Madras. Next. And also we wanted to use this Air Quality Management Association as a platform. Uh, if some technology is available, some there is a problem in a local area, uh, and then uh, we can provide some expertise to address the problem. That's another aspect. And uh, we also started this uh, clean air, uh, uh, clean environment for planetary health in Asia. Uh, this is an uh, UKRE uh, sponsored uh, research and basically which focus on uh, engaging the various researchers, citizens, policymakers, health sector, experts, industry, and other uh, stakeholders uh, to uh, you know have a long lasting partnership to tackle various environmental and non communicable diseases and also use this platform to identify in some country if it is works or some area if particular a technology or a particular uh, management plan works, we should learn that why it is can, can, can be cannot be adapted in other places. If there are some challenges, then we'll see how to improve that. And also use this as a strengthen our international cooperation, knowledge exchange uh, in addressing various environmental issues. Capacity building and capability building is uh, another thrust in our uh, 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 group where we try to engage the young researcher at the early stage and uh, see that we motivate them to go for higher studies or develop some professional skills to address the problem. Of course, we will uh, you know, uh, use opportunities to generate resources, for example, submitting a joint proposals uh, to various funding agencies. Next. So this was I was mentioning to you, and uh, I'll be happy uh, if it is a possibility for you to travel to India. So this will be happening uh, uh, in uh, uh, December 18 to 20, just a week before Christmas. So maybe mm -hmm. you can also plan your Christmas here. So <laughs> this will happen in uh, IIT Madras, and uh, so we have uh, these are the earlier last uh, air quality management conference uh, uh, photo. Uh, th that gives uh, some idea and uh, about uh, the various works which we are carrying out uh, at IIT Madras. Uh, next slide. Okay, now I, I invite uh, uh, my student, uh, Dr. Mr. Ms. Ch Chaitra, to introduce you, and then uh, your platform is over to you for delivering the talk. Chaitra, over to you, Chaitra. Uh, Dr. G. H. Jan. Uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the, Unis at the University of Southern California. Her area of research is to investigate the in, uh, interactions of air quality, climate and society, quantifying the health and strategies to mitigate climate change and air pollution. Dr. Zhang 
holds a PhD in Environmental Engineering from USC and BS in Atmospheric Sciences from Peking University. Dr. Jiang was the manager of Mobile Source Technology Assessment and Modeling Section at the California Air Resources Board, where she led a team of scientists and engineers to conduct original research projects, develop emission inventory, and to inform first of their kind policies, which was aimed at promoting electric vehicles and reducing air pollutant emissions. In addition to all this, she chairs the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Committee of the Chinese American Engineers and Scientists Association of Southern California and serves the Secretary of Air and Waste Management Association, West Coast Section. Today, uh, she will be talking on the effectiveness, core benefits and risks of climate change mitigation or adaptation strategies adopting solar reflective surfaces and decarbonizing the transportation and energy systems. We are happy to have you for the air quality management lecture series, ma'am. Thank you and kindly share your screen to start the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks for having me here. I hope you can see my screen. Can you can yes. see my screen? Okay, yes, awesome. Definitely. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm so impressed by your leadership in air quality management in India, and um, um, I'm so excited to present uh, my research. And actually, this is my first talk in my new role for the international community. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Uh, I just transitioned from being a manager at the California Air Resources Board to now assistant professor at USC this semester. So uh, very excited to present my research that uh, assesses the effectiveness, uh, co-benefits and risks of climate change mitigation adaptation strategies. Particularly, I will dive into um, climate change uh, mitigation, uh, uh, one strategy, one climate change uh, adaptation strategy, adopting solar reflective surfaces. And I will also briefly talk about uh, my postdoc and uh, previous research at uh, CARP, the California Air Resources Board, on decarbonizing the energy and transportation systems, a climate change mitigation strategy. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators at the University of Southern California, Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, Peak University, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, South Coast Air Quality Management District, California Energy Commission, and uh, my undergraduate research advisors, and most importantly, my PhD uh, research advisor, Professor uh, George Van Weiss, my family, my co colleagues at the California Air Resources Board, CARP, and uh, funding agencies. So you can see, like, we're doing some really interdisciplinary uh, research that really needs expertise from different agencies and stakeholders. So the motivation of our research is the changing climate which is becoming an increasing threat to the sustainability of our society. So you can see from the figure on the left, according to IPCC, if we continue to emit greenhouse gases as we do now, there will be a four degree Celsius increase in global average temperature by the end of this century. And even if we substantially cut greenhouse gas emissions, there will still be a two degree Celsius temperature increase as compared to pre-industrial level. So the global temperature rise will lead to different consequences uh, in different regions. And you can see the consequences in the figure on the right uh, in the US. In the west coast of the US where we live, so you know, I'm from California, uh, and um, we're, we're gonna experience more increased temperatures, extreme heat events, precipitation, sea level rise, wildfires, et cetera. So the consequences are different in different re regions. And what can we do to handle this climate crisis? We need mitigation strategies that can reduce the global warming trend. But given that you know, the global climate change is inevitably happening, we also need adaptation strategies that can help different regions adapt to future climate change. So my research focuses on the mitigation adaptation strategies in cities, because first, big cities are high emitter of greenhouse gases. And second, cities are where most of the population are located and exposed to the consequences of climate change. So it's important to note that we need to take a systems approach uh, when we look at climate change mitigation adaptation strategies. So this schema here describes interactions between climate, air quality, and society. So climate change is impacting air quality, uh, land cover, and different sectors of our society. But in the meantime, it's also affected by uh, air pollution and land cover change. 
And climate change is actually caused by greenhouse gas emissions from different sectors of our society, particularly the energy and transportation sectors in cities. And these interactions are complex, so it's important to keep in mind that uh, when we investigate uh, climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation strategies, we need to think about uh, uh, you know, their interactions and uh, use a systems approach to address them. So I seek synergistic solutions that can hopefully solve multiple environmental challenges at the same time, you know, help with climate and air quality, or at least by studying these interactions, my research can help decision makers better understand the synergies and trade-offs of the climate change solutions. In today's presentation, I'll discuss my research on the effectiveness and co-benefits or penalties of climate change mitigation adaptation strategies. Uh, I'll focus on the climate change adaptation strategy, adopting solar reflective surfaces in cities, and I'll briefly talk about um, my previous work on um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the energy and transportation sectors, a climate change mitigation strategy. Okay, so now let's deep dive into adopting solar reflective surfaces. Um, adopting solar reflective walls and roofs, as I'll show later, uh, is a way to change building reflectance and land cover of cities. And my research investigated their effectiveness in reducing urban air temperatures, um, you know, how they affect urban climate, and their impacts on air quality and possible impacts on global climate. So we look into how adopting cool surfaces um, can affect the climate uh, in Southern California. And not, this is not only because I'm from the University of Southern California, but also because uh, global climate change is projected to increase the frequency of extreme heat days in Southern California. So you can see from this bar chart, by the uh, middle of the century, the number of extreme heat days uh, in different cities in Southern California will double or even triple the number at present in different cities. Uh, so here's the city of Los Angeles where USC is located at. I think I just got a notification. Is there any question? I'll just continue. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have like questions. I don't think I can see the chat. Yeah, we, will, we will have a questions at the end. So oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think I saw something pop up. But no, no it's worries. The I'll just continue. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, so the point is that climate change is projected to increase extreme heat days in Southern California cities. And then layering on top of the global temperature rises, uh, people living in cities are suffering more from rising temperatures because of the urban heat island effect, which describes cities being hotter than their surrounding uh, rural areas. So the urban heat island effect is mainly contributed by land cover change including the extensive use of dark surfaces, thermally massive materials like asphalt concrete, less vegetation in cities, and more atmogenic heating. And also the geometry of urban canyons. So by geometry, I mean the, uh, by urban canyon, I mean the space between buildings and above streets uh, can trap both shortwave and longwave radiation. So the combination of global climate change and urban heat island effect uh, brings severe heat related challenges for city dwellers, uh, including increases in heat stroke and exhaustion rates and summertime peak energy use. So what can we do to mitigate urban heat and help communities adapt to future climate change? One economic solution is adopting solar reflective cool surfaces. So the main characteristic of cool surfaces is their uh, high solar reflectance, aka uh, solar albedo. Also uh, defined here, so albedo is the ratio of reflected to incident sunlight, and it's in the range of zero to one. So a very dark roof can have albedo of 0 0.05, meaning that it reflects only five percent of uh, incident sunlight, and then a very reflective roof can have albedo of 0.9. Uh, meaning that reflects 90% of incident sunlight. Uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles, the average roof albedo is around 0.2. And the easiest way of making a cool roof is just uh, paint the roof with light color. And just like you feel cooler when you're in light colored uh, clothing, the buildings will feel cooler and then emit uh, less uh, 
heat and uh, radiation in back to space and cool the buildings below and the atmosphere above. And similar to the concept of cool roofs, uh, there are also cool pavements. The city of Los Angeles uh, have been taking actions in promoting the adoptions of cool roofs. Um, so Los Angeles requires new all, um, all new and refurbished homes to have solar reflective cool roofs. Just on a side note, uh, for people who don't want uh, white roofs on their houses, if they think it's boring, there are also other color options. So when you look at these products, uh, they're not looking very reflective because they're not reflective in the visible spectrum, but they can reflect more near infrared light. So there are quite some studies that uh, had examined the climate effects of raising uh, albedo of horizontal surfaces like roofs in different cities. But there wasn't a single study that assessed the influence of increasing the albedo of vertical surfaces like walls on temperatures. And the, wall, the way walls interact with solar radiation is different from roofs uh, and can lead to different consequences as I'll show later. So we thought that cool walls were a missed opportunity for reducing urban temperatures, uh, saving energy and adapting to climate change. So our study for the first time answered uh, three research questions. What are the climate effects of cool walls? How do the climate effects of cool walls compare with cool roofs? And what are the influences of cool surfaces on air quality? Particularly, there was a lack of study on their influences on PM 2.5. So to estimate the climate and air quality impacts, uh, we set up WORF, the weather research and forecasting model, and WORFCAM, a regional air quality model on high performance computing servers. Um, and these two models are the state-of-the-art regional climate and air quality models. So WARF can provide uh, meteorology uh, co-variable outputs uh, like air temperature, wind speed, uh, humidity, etc. And then uh, WARFCAM can generate uh, air quality related uh, outputs like PM2.5 concentrations by species and ozone concentrations, NOx, etc. And to make sure that these models are suitable for simulating uh, the atmosphere in Los Angeles region, uh, we made changes such as adopting a new parameterization to diagnose canyon air temperatures. And uh, we also make sure that uh, the input variables of the model account for the situation in Los Angeles and in Southern California. And these input variables include land cover, meteorological conditions, uh, emissions data, uh, etc. Um, and just want to note that uh, it's important for urban climate simulations to use realistic urban morphology like, or urban geometry. Uh, so basically, we need to have a realistic description of ground width uh, and roof width and building height, especially when we're looking at you know, comparing the influence of increasing albedo of walls versus roofs. So to have a realistic building height to ground width ratio, we derived these parameters using the data from LARIAC, Los Angeles Region Imagery Acquisition uh, Consortium Program, uh, which maps every building in Los Angeles County in a GIS fashion. And on top of that, we also had another data set that marked uh, street center lines. So this way we cannot properly account for building uh, shading and view factors as well as roof to wall area ratio that uh, so so that we can make a system comparison between adopting cool walls versus roofs. Okay, so using this input model, uh, we simulated five scenarios for July. Uh, the control scenario where the albedos of walls and roofs are both 0.1. Uh, two cool wall scenarios where wall albedo is increased by 0.4 and 0.8 and cool, uh, two cool roof scenarios uh, where roof albedo is increased by 0.4 and 0.8. Uh, so the albedo increase, uh, you know, the same for the cool wall scenarios and cool roof scenarios, so that we could make a fair comparison between cool walls versus roofs. Uh, and we also wanted to check the linearity, um, like how uh, the change would respond to the change in delta albedo. Uh, so basically, uh, if increasing wall albedo by 0.4 will lead to half of the change when increasing wall albedo by 0.8, then we can actually interpolate the results for uh, you know different uh, uh, value of albedo change. So here are the results. Um, first, uh, you know, this plot shows the innermost domain of our WORF simulations, which covers the entire Southern California. 
And here uh, is the uh, Los Angeles metropolitan area and the city of LA is roughly here. Um, so here we're showing how increasing water beetle of uh, 0.8 uh, or 80% would influence grid cell beetle. Uh, grid cell beetle represents a bird's eye view of both uh, impervious and previous surfaces within our modeled urban areas. So you can think of this as the effectiveness of adopting cool walls in altering um, solar radiation um, or reflectance uh, in cities. So you can see uh, larger increases in the grid cell beetle in central LA re region uh, because that's where uh, urban fraction is highest. So essentially, uh, you know, urban fraction is higher here, and then they have more walls, and cool walls can inf influence the uh, urban albedo more significantly. And then when you compare uh, the albedo between uh, 6 p.m. and 12 p.m., uh, you can see that the increase in grid albedo is largest in the early morning, and actually also in the late afternoon than at noon. Uh, and that's because uh, I, when you know, when the sun is um, like in the early morning, the walls see most of the sunlight. And then as the sun moves up, uh, the walls, uh, especially at noon, uh, barely see any sunlight, right? But then we calculated um, the cumulative daytime uh, increase in uh, reflected solar radiation. And we found that uh, cool roofs are more effective in uh, increasing reflected solar radiation than cool walls on an aggregate level. Uh, and this is because of three reason, reasons. Um, first, I, well, I should say like three factors led to the differences uh, in how they affect uh, urban energy budgets. Uh, so the first re, um, factor is uh, solar irradiance onto walls versus roofs. Uh, so solar irradiance on walls is about 40% of that on roofs in July. Uh, and then uh, the second factor is wall area versus roof area. So actually, uh, in LA, wall area is about a factor of two greater than roof area. Uh, the last factor is that uh, unlike solar radiation reflected from a horizontal surface like roofs, solar radiation impinging on walls can experience multiple reflections and absorptions, uh, resulting in increased absorption of ra radiation within the urban canyon. Um, so basically, solar radiation that's reflected by walls uh, is partially absorbed by opposing walls or pavements, uh, and walls can also be shaded. So all of this is related to uh, urban geometry. So in our mo model, the reflection reflected by uh, roofs is assumed to directly escape the canopy, uh, but those reflected by walls uh, could potentially be reabsorbed by opposing walls and pavements, making it less effective in uh, getting rid of the solar radiation. So now I'm getting to how adopting cool walls can influence uh, near surface air temperatures. So cool walls can reduce uh, canyon air temperatures throughout Los Angeles basin. And larger decreases in temperatures can be found in inland urban areas as compared to coastal areas. And this is likely because the effects of cool walls and roofs accumulate as sea breeze and vax air from west to east. Uh, comparing 2 p.m. versus 8 p.m., there are roughly similar temperature changes. And then we found that on daily average, uh, canyon air temperature reductions are similar for uh, cool roofs and walls. Uh, and the relationship is also roughly linear. So about 0 0.05 degrees Celsius per 0.1 albedo increase for cool walls and 0 0.06 uh, degrees Celsius for 0.1 uh, albedo increase for uh, cool roofs. Uh, I'm proud that our study was used as a basis to formulate uh, a nationwide building credit for LEED, um, uh, which is like a building standard uh, for green building in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, green Building Council now gives uh, LEED credits for using cool walls to mitigate urban heat islands. Okay, so now we can see that uh, cool walls uh, and roofs can both reduce uh, urban air temperatures. And now, what are the air quality effects of adopting solar reflective surfaces? As I described in the beginning, uh, climate and air quality interact, right? So cool surfaces can increase city albedo and decrease surface air temperatures. In Los Angeles, it can also reduce uh, the mixing height of pollutants and wind temperature because uh, sorry, wind speed, because wind speed is driven by um, sea breeze that's driven by temperature contrast between land and sea in Los Angeles. 
So uh, because of the reduction in wind speed and mixing height of pollutants, the dispersion of pollutants will be surprised. Uh, here we call it ventilation that uh, will be surprised. Uh, and that will lead to increases in pollution levels for ozone and particulate matter. However, for ozone, uh, temperature dependent reactions and emissions will be slowed down. And, that, and as a secondary pollutant, uh, ozone production is also expected to be slowed down. For particulate matter, the partitioning uh, between different phases and secondary PM formation can uh, compete with each other and affect it in uh, different ways. So, given these competing pathways, uh, we use WorfCam to quantify their outcome. And for the first time, quantify the influence of adopting solar reflective surfaces on different PM species and attributed the changes to different pathways shown here. So here are the results. Um, first, for ozone, uh, I'm showing the control scenario and the changes in daily uh, maximum uh, eight hour ozone concentrations when you adopt uh, cool walls and roofs. Um, for adopting cool walls uh, in the middle, and you can see that uh, cool walls and roofs can both reduce ozone concentrations uh, with more significant uh, reductions induced by uh, cool roofs. Uh, and these reductions uh, can be attributed to slower temperature dependent photochemical reactions. However, uh, they can actually slightly increase daily average uh, PM 2.5 concentrations. Uh, on average, uh, 0 0.03 microgram per cubic meter and 0 0.04 microgram per cubic meter for adopting uh, cool walls and roofs, respectively. So, why is that? Going back to the physiochemical process that we, uh, processes that we described, uh, so these are the processes that can drive uh, changes in PM 2.5 concentrations. Um, so by ventilation here again, I mean the air exchange between emission source region and other regions and between the air pollutant emissions near the ground and atmosphere above us. Um, so decreases in ventilation impede the dilution of pollutants uh, and leading to uh, increases in near surface uh, pollutant concentrations. So here we use uh, carbon monoxide uh, concentrations as a tracer to quantify uh, the reduced uh, the impact of the reduced uh, ventilation, uh, because carbon monoxide is considered a chemically inert pollutant at urban scale, uh, with concentrations controlled by mainly meteorological conditions. So we quantified the changes in uh, the concentrations of different PM two point five species that's attributable to reduced ventilation showing in yellow and uh, versus other factors uh, showing in red. Um, so here are two examples. Um, for black carbon aerosols, which are mainly, uh, which are directly emitted instead of being produced in the atmosphere uh, by chemical reactions, the increases in their concentrations can be mostly uh, attributed to reduced ventilation. And then for nitrate, a semi-volatile uh, species, the increase in nitrate concentrations uh, cannot be attributed to ventilation and can be attributed to uh, increasing gas to particle conversion. So that's very interesting from uh, the scientific point of view as well. The takeaway messages are um, first, uh, increasing wall and roof albedo can lead to ozone concentration reductions while slightly increasing PM2.5 concentrations. So for policymakers, it's important to assess the impact, not just from a climate perspective, but also from an air quality perspective. Okay, so now we know that cool surfaces can be an effective way of reducing urban temperatures and serve as a climate change adaptation strategy for cities um, and you know, have this potential impact on air quality. Uh, can they reduce temperatures at larger scale and mitigate global climate change, reducing global average temperatures? Um, the next study uh, I will present uh, quantified uh, the potential global climate impacts of adopting cool roofs. So if you were in person having this seminar, I would have asked you to guess like what their impact would be, but I'll just show that now. So before my study, there were uh, five studies on the global climate impact of cool roofs. And here I summarize uh, their findings. Uh, the X axis uh, is the complexity of the models used by different studies. And the Y axis shows the magnitude of the reported cooling effect. So all these four studies um, 
reported a cooling effect, but they all used uh, relatively simplified energy balance uh, land or climate models. Um, and there was only one study that used a sophisticated Earth system model, and they found a warming effect of cool roofs, which was counterintuitive. So they hypothesized that the warming is due to polar cloud feedback and the absorption of reflected radiation by black carbon aerosols. Um, so the disagreement of their studies um, motivated our research to revisit this topic using another sophisticated Earth system model. So guess what we have found? <laughs> So we found that adopting uh, cool roofs could reduce global mean air temperature by 0 0.002 degrees Celsius with a certainty of uh, 0 0.026 degrees Celsius. So, you know, it can potentially induce a cooling effect, but it's not statistically uh, significant. So, uh, we shouldn't rely on cool uh, surfaces to uh, combat global warming trends. Uh, as a mitigation strategy and large scale reductions of greenhouse gases are still very necessary beyond adoption of cool roofs. Okay, so just to summarize uh, what we just talked about. Um, oops. So, uh, cool surfaces are effectively reducing local air temperatures. Uh, they can bring cold benefits in reducing ozone, but penalties for increasing particulate matter uh, and their impact on global uh, climate uh, is negligible. So in the long term, we still need to massively reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, especially from the major sources. And in the US, uh, the transportation and electricity generation sectors are the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And you may have seen that the US is committed to slashing greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. So to achieve this national goal, what can a city or state do uh, to speed up greenhouse gas uh, in, uh, emission reductions, and how will this benefit its local communities? With these questions in mind, uh, we'll get into uh, you know, the, another topic. I'll talk briefly on uh, decarbonizing the transportation and energy sectors. Uh, I'll discuss uh, my postdoc work uh, for the so-called LA 100 project for the city of LA. Uh, and then my previous work uh, with the California Air Resources Board uh, for uh, California. But just this disclaimer that I'm no longer working at CARB, so I'm not speaking for on behalf of CARB at all, just uh, myself sharing uh, some of our previous work. So for the city of LA, uh, we collaborated with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to analyze pathways uh, towards a 100% uh, clean power system along with the push to electrify the building and energy sectors, the so-called LA 100 study. Uh, at USC, we analyzed air quality co-benefits of LA 100's future scenarios. And these scenarios have different assumptions uh, for the renewable energy profile of electrification production and uh, different levels of electrification for different sectors listed here, like buildings uh, and transportation with the ports, et cetera. Um, so, we constructed the emissions inventory using uh, NROLS, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's power capacity and demand modeling output. And we carried out air quality simulations to assess uh, the consequences on air quality uh, in co different communities in LA. So, first, we found that um, you know, the LA 100 scenarios with increased electrification level uh, and uh, renewable energy adoption uh, would lead to decreases in PM 2.5 concentration uh, emissions and NOx emissions. And electrifying the transportation sector contributed the most to the emissions reductions. As a result, uh, on the one hand, PM 2.5 concentrations would decrease due to the reduction in primary PM 2.5 emissions. But on the other hand, there will be uh, there would be increases in ozone concentrations for most parts of Los Angeles due to uh, NOx emission reductions uh, and the nonlinearity of ozone chemistry. So our collaborator at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, translated this mixed air quality impacts into monetized uh, health uh, benefits of 1.4 million dollars in 2045 and found that uh, these benefits are similar for uh, disadvantaged communities uh, and non-disadvantaged communities. So using our LA 100 study as the reference, uh, the mayor made a commitment to 100% uh, carbon-free energy by 2035, 
uh, 10 years ahead of its previous goal and a push for electrification. So that study um, highlighted the importance of uh, adopting zero emission vehicles uh, in changing uh, local air quality. And this motivated me to join the California Air Resources Board uh, to conduct research that informs uh, policy making uh, in the state of California. So at CARB, uh, I worked on developing and improving our emissions inventory model for vehicles, uh, namely MFAC. So this model uh, provides like an official emissions inventory for academics and the industry, uh, and also serves as the foundation of um, our science-based planning and rulemaking efforts, uh, you know, such as the climate change scoping plan, uh, state implementation plan, which handles uh, criteria air pollutants like ozone and PM2.5, as well as regulations, uh, including the advanced clean uh, trucks, advanced clean cars regulation. So given the importance of this model, uh, we update this model every three to four years with the latest uh, data for vehicle activity and emission factors uh, and to reflect the latest regulations. So for example, in our latest version of the model, I led the development of a new framework for forecasting the market share of zero emission vehicles based on uh, consumer behavior. And we also, or our team also conducted research to inform uh, first of their kind regulations uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution emissions from the transportation sector. Uh, so I will give you two examples. Uh, the first one is the clean mile standard, uh, which required uh, transportation network companies, uh, namely Uber and Lyft to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Actually, I did a Google search before this uh, seminar, and I think the counterpart of them is probably called Ola Caps in India. Um, anyway, we analyzed ma massive tri uh, trip level data from Uber and Lyft and found that their fleet has a much higher greenhouse gas emissions per passenger mile traveled than the California fleet average. Um, I was thinking like if we're gonna talk in person, I would uh, ask you to guess like, why is that? Uh, but I'll just give the answer now. Uh, so the reason is that because we look at uh, the passenger miles traveled uh, and for Uber and Lyft, uh, they also have the so-called dead hiding mileage when the driver is on their way to pick up a passenger. Um, so they're essentially wasting uh, those mileage on their way of uh, picking up a passenger and those don't count towards in the passenger miles traveled. And that's why their per passenger mile travel greenhouse gas emissions so much higher than the California fleet average. So uh, our findings uh, help uh, the you know, our regulatory team to set goals for reducing the greenhouse gas emissions in future year because we provided the emissions inventory for uh, their base year, uh, and also identified uh, the compliance options of these companies such as decreasing that hiding miles increasing electric vehicles in their fleets and encouraging carpooling. So the second regulation that supported is the Advanced Clean Cars 2 regulation. And the figure here shows the regulations requirement for zero emission vehicles, in new vehicle sales from manufacturers in California. Um, so you can see it's a very uh, aggressive regulation uh, with the goal of achieving 100% uh, zero emission vehicles in new sales by 2035. Uh, and our team quantified the emission benefits of this regulation. Um, and in addition to our own research, we also um, collaborate with stakeholders uh, and manage research contracts to inform zero emission uh, vehicle incentives and regulations, and uh, having a more pre uh, precise estimation of uh, their emissions in our inventory. Uh, we partner with the California Energy Commission, Public Utilities uh, Commission, Department of Transportation, local air districts, uh, Federal Environmental uh, Protection Agency, uh, and manage contracts related to zero emission vehicle uh, market share. Yeah, so you can see that we really need a collaborative effort to handle uh, these uh, challenges and figure out solutions to climate change and air pollution issues in California. So just to summarize on this topic, uh, first uh, in Los Angeles, we found that electrification and renewable energy adoption would increase ozone by reduce PM, leading to public health co benefits. And in California, uh, refining emissions inventory uh, is important to policy development, uh, and we're continuing doing uh, research uh, on that. 
So now transition to my future research uh, at the California Air Resources Board, uh, my, uh, sorry, my, at the University of Southern California. Sorry, I feel like I'm still in my transitioning phase. <laughs> so I will continue to study the uh, interactions of climate, air quality, and different aspects of our society. Uh, and adopt a system approach for evaluating climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies. So, uh, our group will be working on more aspects in the society, uh, particularly uh, public health and equity, because uh, the consequences of climate change and pollution are distributed inevitably among uh, different demographics and different communities. And I just started working with professors in public health to assess how uh, these strategies may influence uh, both uh, health and equity outcomes. Uh, and we'll also consider other ways of interactions, for example, how future climate change scenarios can affect air quality. Uh, so next, I'll give you a little bit more details about uh, the future work I built on, uh, built on the two topics of research that I just presented. Uh, the first topic, climate change adaptation strategies of changing land covering of cities. So we heard about our work that assessed the air quality impacts of solar reflected cool roofs and walls. But here are also other strategies, including uh, cool pavements, um, cool cars, I mean, cool uh, solar reflected cars, right? And trees, uh, drought tolerant vegetation. So in the short term, uh, we will work on assessing the urban climate and air quality impacts of these other strategies. And in the long term, uh, our goal is to develop a holistic framework to evaluate the cost effectiveness of these strategies, which can be used to assess which strategy or combinations of strategies would work best for different cities um, and include you know, other factors such as thermal uh, comfort, um, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from producing those materials, of, uh, of you know, uh, the coating of uh, roofs, etc. And then the second research topic that we will further explore is the impacts of energy and transportation policies. Uh, and um, we have heard that California has uh, ambitious electrification goals for the transportation sector. You know, not only in the light duty vehicle sector, but also in the heavy duty uh, vehicle uh, sector and off road equipment. Um, but, you know, zero emission vehicles, they have zero tailpipe emissions, but they still have tire wear and brake wear PM emissions. So, what will be the impact of these policies on their tire wear and brake wear PM uh, emissions and uh, people's exposure to uh, these PM concentrations? And uh, the other question uh, is like, what are the community scale impacts of these transportation and energy policies? And uh, what will be the impacts on the different climate change scenarios? So to wrap up, I really think that to achieve the ultimate goal of uh, advancing a safe approach for uh, ch climate change solutions in cities, we need multidisciplinary expertise. So uh, I really hope to serve as a bridge among different expertise uh, for interdisciplinary research and also bridge acad uh, academia and decision make makers, given my experience working uh, in both sides to create synergies. So as a starting point, uh, we will um, improve modeling tools to better simulate interactions between emissions, air quality, and climate for Los Angeles and California, and better understand how the interactions will change uh, under a global uh, climate change scenario. And then I look forward to merging expertise of uh, transportation, energy, urban planning, uh, public health, uh, to investigate how these uh, you know, strategies uh, would affect air quality, climate, and health. And I think it's also important to reach decision makers and stakeholders. Uh, so uh, we will solicit the needs from uh, governments and communities through our uh, outreach and uh, you know, communication. So in general, I think Los Angeles Cal and California are a great starting point for researching uh, climate change solutions for cities. And I also want to scale up my research to impact other states and uh, hopefully other countries in the world. And that's why I'm so excited about giving a talk here today. Um, that's my last slide, but I also want to acknowledge uh, my PhD advisor, um, Professor George Van Weiss. Uh, he was uh, a man that truly influenced public policy and touched many lives. Uh, he passed away, unfortunately, very sadly in uh, 2021 uh, at a very young age, uh, but he has made a tremendous impact on uh, many students, including myself. He was a professor by day and a professional bass player by night, a very caring, dedicated advisor at that. So he also was the person who inspired me to 
uh, go back to academia and uh, I hope I can pass the inspirations that he gave to me to other students. So I'm recruiting a postdoc. Um, I will be recruiting more PhD students in fall 2025. If you're interested, uh, feel free to check out our website or email me um, or um, this is my LinkedIn. So thank you for attention. I hope you enjoyed your dinner and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you very much for a uh, uh, very informative and uh, excellent talk. Uh, I think you have covered up starting from looking into the problems and look how the uh, you know cool roof and cool walls can benefit both uh, the climate and also the air quality. Then you have looked into mitigation measures. It's a wonderful talk and you, you covered various aspects. I started looking into the materials which uh, you know being uh, used uh, looking at the climatic aspects for example in us the kind of materials that kind of you know construction they use for building a wall or a roof and uh, looking at uh, you know our india or china or maybe other south asian countries the materials could be quite different so in that mm -hmm. context uh, how do you uh, see that whether whatever the, the developed countries uh, technology adapted could be, you know, uh, possibility replicating there in the uh, Asian countries. Mm, that's a very good question. So, first of all, I think one key difference in my mind is that in LA, we have um, more like single family homes. Or in the U.S. in general, like, but in like China and India, uh, but I, I'm not sure about India, honestly. But in China, in big cities, uh, they're all like skyscrapers. So the wall area to roof area is very different, right? In that sense, and you know the density of cities are also very different. So I'll say like my approach because it's a modeling approach. It can be used uh, in, uh, in other cities as well. Actually, I saw not another paper on this in a city in in China. Uh, on a similar topic, they also look into cool walls versus roofs uh, following our study. Uh, but uh, I think you asked a good question about like realistically, like uh, the differences, right? So I think that really depends on you know, the particular city. The easiest way of making you know, a cool roof or cool walls just to have it as light color or painted white, right? So that's that should be relatively straightforward, but that may also lead to uh, other side effects. Like if you uh, have a very dense city, if you paint everything white, will the pedestrians feel like the glare? Like they may feel uncomfortable, so even though the temperature could potentially be decreased, uh, they may feel uh, uncomfortable. So I really think that we need to take a system approach to look at all these uh, aspects. So, so that's a good question. Um, if you're interested, we could talk more, I guess, <laughs> offline. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the follow-up question I would like to, uh, you know, view your uh, comments. Uh, you know, where the, the, when the sun rises and uh, you know different mm -hmm. times of the day. Uh, yeah. The walls, uh, you know, subjected to the radiation effect will be changes. Whereas the roof will be like, you know, most yeah. of the the artist part of the day will be exposed. As a result, do you think that uh, uh, you know different sides of the wall and depending on the the orientation, all this, yeah, and also exactly. the surface area, how it yeah, is, yeah. you know, will influence. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very great question. Yeah, so in our model, we're essentially making a simplified uh, assumption. Yeah, but definitely mm -hmm. if uh, we can, um, I feel like the modeling capacity right now doesn't really re resolve those detailed impacts, but that's an area I'm interested in, like further looking into, like could we develop the model in a way that can actually simulate the urban, like, you know, orientation of buildings uh, and then figure out like, what's the most effective way of uh, changing that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe my other, other question I was just, I really, uh, really mm -hmm. uh, you know, happy to see that you looked into some of the paving the, you know, the surfaces of the road. That is a quite, uh, you know, interesting from the countries like India, like, you know, where the lot of emissions uh, could have been come uh, because the, the bitumen, which uh, most of the road surface uh, will absorb mm -hmm. heat during the uh, daytime and uh, maybe that contributes more heat and mm -hmm. probably bringing out this, uh, you know, cool surface uh, you know, on the pavement is uh, uh, quite, uh, you know, innovative. Uh, so what do you think, like, you know, uh, for, for example, in the uh, uh, other countries, maybe they use uh, cement 
uh, roads but uh, here mm -hmm. in most of the our uh, in developing countries uh, mm -hmm. in asia they use uh, bitumen so the temperature uh, you know contributed by these surfaces could be different so i mean do you think that uh, the surfacing of this kind of uh, material cool materials will benefit in terms of addressing the climate change yeah in, in short i think yes <laughs> yeah Yes. Okay, that's that's uh, yeah good good, uh, uh, and uh, coming to the uh, your uh, policy aspects, the mitigation uh, is a very challenging. So sometimes you showed that uh, uh, you know I'm I'm just trying to look at it uh, the personalized vehicles. So like you have made a very nice mm -hmm. comparison Uber and other uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, taxi services. Uh, of course, in India we also have Ola apart from various other Uber. Okay, so I got that right. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. I, I mean, you may be right because uh, sometimes the the per person uh, trip made uh, will be quite uh, contributing in terms of you know uh, carbon emissions. Uh, so, how do we in, uh, in incentivize uh, public uh, to you know move to a public transport uh, maybe rather than an individual uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know way of using it or uh, do you also look at it uh, electric vehicles the way you have mentioned it uh, is that somebody could also pick up okay this is the kind of a less emission contributing vehicle i should pick up this vehicle oh my goodness that's a fantastic question so basically we could reduce emissions by reducing vehicle miles traveled or by reducing their emission factors and in california i feel it's being recorded so I, but i'm not speaking on behalf of carb at all but what i heard is that you know the government really tried hard to, especially I mean, in Southern California, to to help to subsidize public transportation, but it just didn't work because of you know, first of all, uh, people have their you know habits. I feel like when I went back to China, I always take um, public transportation. It's so convenient. It was really convenient, but in LA, um, it's not that convenient. Uh, Honestly, and it's a chicken egg problem. So because it's not convenient, so there's less ridership. So uh, then there will be like fewer uh, buses uh, or this type of public transportation. So it's a it's really a challenge. So I think the, the now like they realize okay, so it's hard to really encourage people to take public transportation while they continue subsidizing public transportation. They're also subsidizing uh, zero emission vehicles. Like when you purchase uh, electric vehicles, you get, you know, some uh, subsidy uh, or incentive um, rebate that can uh, can promote this type of technology. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's just unfortunate uh, reality here uh, in California that people really like driving a lot um, and uh, the public transportation system is not considered um, convenient as compared to like China. I'm, I'm not sure about India. Do people like go um, on transportation, uh, public transportation more than personal yeah, vehicles? Yeah. Or? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is uh... You know, in India is uh, uh, like more public transport, uh, also personalized vehicle. It's an equal yeah. share is there, but we wanted to uh, provide more and more because we, we the now metro is happening in many cities. So hopefully mm -hmm. we'll see that uh, much more advantage with using this uh, you know mass transport system. Mm -hmm. Now I, I also wanted you to touch upon. Uh, 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 you know, oh, uh, you, you just quickly add. So I think the other thing is that because in, in LA it's like uh, spread out. Uh, when you come here, yeah. you will see. Yeah, so it's not like a dense uh, city area. So that makes it harder to to arrange this like public transportation. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted you to you know just look at it because the uh, many, many cities now construction is uh, increasing and probably if you try to look at it, significant uh, sources of particulate pollution in, in any cities in India is maybe, of course, in China also, maybe mm -hmm. contributed significantly because of this construction activities and mm -hmm. construction related uh, vehicle movement, which contributes more pollution. So you mm -hmm. mentioned in one of our slides that, you know, truck emissions and off-road uh, vehicle emissions. Do you notice yeah. this, they are started increasing uh, their contributions to the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, the carbon uh, emissions? Yeah, so I would say in LA, um, the 
ports activity are increasing over the years, uh, but actually the share of the ports because of the development of other ports, like in the East Coast uh, or in other areas, uh, it's not increasing. Uh, and mm -hmm. then the technology, well, there are more stringent requirements on uh, offer equipment. So the general trend is that uh, it's still de de decreasing over time. However, because of the on-road sector has been having more stringent uh, regulations, so the, of the contribution of the off-road sector uh, is, would increase. Like we look at the relative percentage of the contribution from off-road sectors, uh, that would increase uh, over time for sure. Okay, so uh, there are some couple of questions on the chat box. Uh, will it possible for you to read from the chat box or do you want me to read it? Uh, let's see, okay, so, First question, uh, is that like how much, let's see, how much the potential of electrification of heavy duty vehicles in decarbonizing of port sector? Uh, great question. So actually, uh, California just passed uh, another rule. Uh, if you, you see that the government made a like executive order, uh, which um, aimed for full transition to ZAV, short haul and trade trucks by 2035. So the regulation that we passed is called uh, Advanced Clean Fleet Regulation. So that will require all the trucks visiting the ports of LA and Long Beach um, to be zero emission. Uh, so again, that's a very ambitious goal. There are some like opinions saying like whether that's really realistic, whether the technology is there or not. Um, so I think it's promising because you know California is a big market, uh, and uh, now that the goal is out there, it will kind of so, sort of force the manufacturers to figure out the solution. And CARB also provides incentives uh, for uh, trucks as well uh, for purchasing uh, low emitting uh, trucks. Uh, let's see the second question. I don't think I can see the full question though. So what were the possible confounding factors that may affect? Oh, sorry. Uh, I think I see it. What were the possible confounding factors that might affect the results related to albedo ratio? So, uh, it, so is it more more? Uh, um, sorry, is the question more about the temperature change or air quality change? Uh, Perfect. I'm, I'm I mean, uh, this might be affect the results of an it's a, mostly with an albedo uh, uh, which uh, how this uh, temperature is influencing or what factors which contributing temperature increase in that particular area yeah so for temperature that's mostly depends on uh, urban fraction uh like you know how much in uh, or wall fraction in the urban area or roof fraction in the urban area and also the background uh climate conditions of the, the particular city you're looking at um yeah so that's for temperatures and then for air quality you know that of course also depends on uh the emissions uh and whether the city is in the like nox limited regime or voc limited regime we'll look at ozone chemistry so that could affect uh, ozone concentrations as well. Uh, and then emission factors for frequent tire wear from various light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles and non road construction vehicles, standardization of such emission in urban case. Uh, is this a question or a comment? <laughs> okay, I just, I think I just wanted to understand uh, what is the kind of an emission norms for uh, heavy duty vehicles, particularly in the uh, construction uh, side, because there are large, uh, you know, uh, vehicle which is you operated uh, for construction activities. So, do we have an emission standards for that? Yes, uh, I think they are working on a standard called Tier Five uh, for off-road mm -hmm. uh, equipment. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right, right. So, so there um, is standard, but I think it's not as stringent as uh, on road vehicles. So that's why that's the next low hanging fruit. I'll say. Okay, okay. So, I'm just uh, the, the, the last question they were talking about this uh, urban heat island effect. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we look at the alternative ways like uh, uh, water pervious uh, uh, pavements, green? Parking, you know, green yeah, roof, yeah. of course, even yeah. green walls, all these things. And did, did you look at it? Uh, you know, although you have mentioned about uh, temperature, have mm -hmm. you also seen uh, urban heat island where there is a temperature difference is more than five six degrees, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, an area? Have, have you looked into that? 
Yeah, so, so first of all, I think this question, like alternative ways, yeah, that's uh, our next steps looking into like this okay. other strategies as well, right? Uh, and then uh, regarding overtime effect, so that's a very interesting, uh, I would say tricky question for a city like Los Angeles with spreads out. So it's hard to define rural versus urban in many cases. So we, often when we quantify urban health effects, we use like a model to assume like when you change all the urban areas to you know, native vegetation, what the temperature would be and compare that with a scenario that you have all these uh, buildings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I hope uh, there are no other questions uh, and a very informative talk. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we all really enriched with your uh, lot of experience with understanding, addressing the particular aspect of climate change uh, uh, on behalf of uh, IIT Madras and uh, Air Quality Management uh, uh, Association, Indian International Conference on Air Quality Management. We would like to thank you and uh, see you soon. And uh, we also look forward to your uh, in presence uh, for uh, joining our conference in the coming days, maybe in, in oh. December. Thank you so much for having me and yeah. nice to meet you all. Yeah. Feel free to reach out to me. <laughs> Hope yeah. that there will be yeah, some definitely. publish opportunities. Yeah. See you soon. Thank you. Uh, and before, before, before you leave, I think we'll take some a group photo. I request all of you to uh, start your camera. So I'll just have a picture with Jai. Thanks, yeah. And by the way, I also invited my prospective uh, PhD students uh, who are coming in the fall and uh, math students who are <laughs> working with me right now. Sure. Really excited about my new journey. <laughs> <laughs>